actually. She's sitting here. Brian DeCruz. He's thinking about Glenn DeCruz and Yvonne DeCruz. Yvonne DeCruz. Yvonne DeCruz. Yvonne DeCruz. What about uh, anyone from Pune? Big contingent. What about Mumbai? Awesome. And anyone from Germany? Nice. So we have people from all over the world. And anyone from anywhere else that I haven't mentioned? Canada. Canada. Sorry, that's a big. Thanks for being here. Mexico, Australia, Hong Kong, of course, California. California. Our Sindhi contingent is here. <laughs> Shout out and for the Sindhi yes, contingent yes. here. And Anjali is also Sindhi by, by marriage, so yeah, we, there's three of you, well done. There's Bina here, there's Beng Alvin. Bengaluru, Bengaluru. Amazing, amazing. So thank you guys. Don't forget South Goa. We South Goa, there. of course. The, the, the nice part of Goa. Yeah, there's also Porpuri, yeah. What about all my rallies from Porpuri? Amazing. And Sukura, of course. True, true. Okay. Panjim. Panjim. Panjim, everyone from Panjim. We have a big crowd from Panjim. Amazing. And from the south, some people have come all the way from the south. Thanks, guys. Uh, there are some seats up front. There are lots of seats up front. Please come. Frederick, I can see you behind the tree trying to drink tea. <laughs> He's there allowed to relax. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, great. So, welcome once again. I'm Kunal, and we're all really excited to uh, celebrate my mom, Michelle's first book. First of many books, maybe? No, but no. First and last book, uh, Becoming Goan, uh, which is about her relationship with Goa. Woo! Please come in, please come forward. If anyone needs a seat, there are plenty of seats over here. Not Frederick. Um, come, come and sit in the front. Yeah, there's about, there's about 10 seats over here. So we wanted to, um, we wanted to ask a few questions of our author today so we could get to know more about her since some of you don't know her that well. Um, and we also wanted to learn about the book and um, about her writing process as well. So um, before we start, just some introductions uh, from the other people here. That other person first, I think, is me, who missed his first cue. Right. So, hi, I'm Bharat. I'm Michelle's husband. And uh, otherwise described as her worst half. Hi, I'm Divya. I'm Michelle's daughter. And the lab in the middle is Haruki, who's featured extensively in the book. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Michelle. Thank you so much for coming to join me to celebrate my first book, Becoming Goan. So she's becoming Goan now. Um, 35 years ago, I met and married a lovely young girl whom I met in Mumbai, and I thought she was a Mumbai girl. Hi. Later on, while dating, I discovered that she was from Pune, so I thought she was a Pune girl. Now she tells me, 35 years later, she's becoming Goan, and more specifically, a Sheolkar. So I'm confused by her identity. So, Michelle, who are you exactly? And um, how do you answer the question, where are you from? Good question. It's taken me some 270 pages or more to figure it out. Uh, I guess I've always struggled to answer the question, where are you from? I think many of us here struggle to answer it. Since we all have personal stories or family stories of migration, we were born somewhere, we live somewhere else, or our parents and grandparents were from some place, but they lived their whole life in another place, and we often wonder where we belong. Where is home? Many of us here are lucky that we have some place to go back to. Many here and more around the world today have a place their family came from, but they can't go back there anymore. So they have had to find home in different places and countries. For me, I know that after living in Pune and Mumbai, and after many countries around the world, I have found a community and a home here in Goa, a place my grandparents left. So would you say that was the trigger or inspiration for finding the book, for writing the book, you finding a home in Goa? 
Yes, that's definitely the bigger theme. But I also felt compelled to record this time in history. I thought of creating a time capsule so you would know life uh, that at one time was in Goa and in Seoli before all this crazy construction took over. To record the Goa I knew and loved for all my little friends here and all my little grandnieces and grandnephews. The Goa and Seoli that I came to with my parents as a kid on holiday from Pune, where I met many people here, including Piki and Nelinia, who are here today. <laughs> Over the years, I kept coming back here when I inherited this house to extend this house and to nag Amit Suktankar, our architect here. Finally, when we moved over the pandemic, I could see how Goa in general and Seoli in particular were changing exponentially. So to use the pandemic cliche, I think that was the capitalist or pivot for my book. So, so with the pandemic as, as the catalyst and the goal to, be, to create a time capsule for, for some of the younger generations, we have some tiny thoughts to some older generations like Uncle Caesar and people who have seen Goa. Um, you, you had this purpose of creating a time capsule and um, we know, with, as with many things that you set your mind to, the process became all-consuming and maybe a little bit obsessive. And you took the project on with determination and focus, and we're obviously very proud of the result. Yeah, Kunal, you said all-consuming process. So let me share a little uh, experience that I had while the process was consuming all. Um, I would sometimes wake up in the middle of the night uh, to get a glass of water. And without my specs on, I would see this, you know, ghostly person sitting in the room, uh, lit by a very spooky looking, looking glow. And I thought, you know, there's a lot of stories in Goa about ghosts in houses. So I wondered, we had one too here. <laughs> and then, of course, with specs on, I realized it was Michelle, sat in a chair at 3 o'clock in the morning with only the glow from her laptop lighting up her face. I got so used to it that if there are ghosts in this house, I'm quite okay with them now. <laughs> So my question is, how long was this all-consuming process of writing the book? So I had started blogging right in the beginning of the pandemic, which was in April 2020. There were all those Zoom parties and toilet paper crisis and some Delgado coffee making binges and all kinds of things. Uh, as things started slowly opening up and we came to Goa, so did half of Indi urban India with their dogs. I met many different people who had moved here and spoke to even more who were wanting to move here. I started thinking about what it meant to be, to be a Goan in Goa today. So I wrote a tongue-in-cheek blog sometime in June 2020. It does appear in an evolved avatar uh, in the chapter, What's So Special About Goans Anyway? My Being Goan blog got some attention from family and friends and few encouraged me to write my year in Provence story. I started wondering if I could actually write a book. I had no idea what that meant. I spoke to my Bandra neighbor, an all-time good guy, Naresh Fernandez, sometime in August or September of 2021. He also encouraged me to write the story and explained to me how this whole traditional publishing process worked. I needed to write a proposal, send some draft chapters to a literary agent who would help me craft my writing into a book. It was very different from writing a blog. So I started writing proposals and sending them to lit agents about October 2021. The rejections started coming in by the beginning of 2022, which added more fuel to my mounting self-doubt about becoming a writer. So I thought of giving up. But every time I heard or saw something that would trigger me, I came home and wrote about it. By May 2022, I was determined to write this book. Whether I found a publisher or not, I would tell my Becoming Goan story. That's when I went to meet Goa's favorite archivist and publisher, Frederick Narona, to ask if he would help me to publish my book. By then, I'd written a few more chapters. He also felt that this book needed a bigger audience and needed to be distributed outside of Goa. He also told me I needed to find a literary agent and a publishing house. I was very lucky to find Jeffrey, who I knew as Harish's wife, 
I remember attending the wedding back in Chennai in 1993, but I honestly didn't know what literary agents did. I now know that Jaipriya's Jacaranda is India's very first literary agency. She called me in July 2022 and said, Michelle, you must write the story. Your story must be told. She was confident she could get the story published. So when she called me in February 2023, saying that Penguin Random House was willing to publish my story, I was already 80% written. I submitted the draft manuscript to the editors around April 2023, and after that, I worked very closely with them. They really helped me to give it structure and form. I needed to explain a lot of Konkani and Portuguese words, Balcao, Falia, and many words I had to learn. Lots of Catholic speak, Navinas, Mochuri cards, Mans Mind Masses. So all of 2023, I was consumed with writing this book. So this is the story on the publishing side. On finding the stories, I have to thank my neighbors, Maria, Tanya, so many other people from my road who helped me. Uh, people who read chapters and gave feedback, Dr. Selsa, Tino, Heta. Poor Cliff De Silva here, he patiently answered my many questions on Samudai's church fees, helped me with all the Konkani words and <laughs> phrases. A tool truly takes a village not just to raise a child, but to write a book. Continuing with this lame child analogy, I was told that writing a book is like giving birth to a child. I have to tell you, I've given birth to two children. It was much easier than writing a book. <laughs> so thanks for that, Mom. <clears throat> um, I think the stories that you share about Goa uh, with Sholem as your focus is really what makes this book uh, unique. So since we're here in Cholim, let's talk more about the chapter on the legends and stories from Cholim. Why did you want to record this village in particular with such detail? So I was on this evolution towards becoming Goan, and I realized how little I knew about Goa. There were so many people who knew a lot more here, like Frederick, like Vivek Menezes, who I followed on Facebook, learned all about Goa and Goan from his writing. I realized that trying to write about Goa was impossible, so I decided to focus on home ground and on Tioli. Other than St. Anthony's Church, Remo and Alexi here, people didn't know that much about Sioli. Special shout out to two Sioli legends, Alexi and Savio John who have helped me a lot in the research and the writing process, and now in the publishing and advertising and promoting process. And thanks to Savio John for this beautiful dress. This is an original from an international fashion designer who's from Sioli right here. That, that he sounds like a commercial break. <laughs> <laughs> He's also kept copies of my book in his uh, store here. I also want to thank Jovera and her father, Sebastian de Cruz, who was the Sioli chronicler, who had written a lot about Sioli, and to Tanya, who gave me all those brochures. I've been able to reproduce a map that he had drawn in my book. I also met Irene here in my yoga class, and she introduced me to her husband here, Sally. His father was the famous Goan musician and novelist, Reginald Fernandez. He told me stories about his father and about Johnson and the Jolly Boys and many more stories and Sioli legends. Talking about music, we have our quirky statue of Beethoven right here in Gausovado. Bharat knew someone from the family who gave me the inside story. I discovered the Matiche Chapel some years ago when my neighbor and good friend Anthony Coelho took me up for the Stations of the Cross. The famous Hilario mangoes come from story, from Sioli, and there were many, many more legends and stories. I'm not giving them all away. You'll have to read the book. However, one last quip, and that is that the beautiful game that we all love, everyone, not just Goans, everyone here I'm sure loves football, was brought to Goa and introduced by an English Jesuit priest first here in Sioli. Okay, no more spoilers. You'll have to read the chapter on finding Sioli stories and legends. So, <laughs> so 
So Seattle is a special place in many ways, and it's amazing to see how every person can connect with it in a different way. As a family, and in a chapter in your book, you talk about the many different Seolis and the many Goas. What do you mean by that? How do you know there are many different versions of Goa and Seoli? And which one do you feel you live in? So every time I met someone or spoken to someone anywhere in the world, not just in India, uh, and they ask you where you come from, I blab on something about Pune, Goa, parents, grandparents. But the moment you say Goa, people's eyes light up. Everyone has a Goa story. Everyone feels a connection to Goa. Everyone feels that Goa is theirs. Goa resonates with people across the world. Everyone who visits or lives here makes it their own special connection to Goa. Everyone has their own version. So I'm always reminded of the story of the elephant and the blind men. Everyone experiences a completely different Goa. There's the hippie Goa, the creative Goa, the luxury Goa, the bohemian Goa, the Russian Goa, and the Goan Goa. There are more Goas, but you'll have to read it in the book. I realized that the Goan Goa was very different from the stereotypical beach party stereotype that you see everywhere being promoted in Bollywood or on social media. And when I lived here, I wanted to belong to the Goan Goa. I wanted to learn about the culture I was born into. And I wanted to write the little bits of the Goan culture that I was learning and that was fast disappearing in Goa today. I think that's a really beautiful thing that no matter what, Goa is accessible to everyone in a unique way. So for now, you recently left Seoli to live in Mandre. What Goa do you feel you live in? Um, <clears throat> I think that you know when people come here from other parts of India, they, they see a lot of empty space. And they see that empty space as a canvas to do something, whether it's to make art or start a business or just relax and, and rejuvenate and, and heal. But I think in seeing that emptiness compared to an, an urban environment, they miss the story, the culture, and, and the history that's here. And, and I think are perhaps disrespectful of that even when they're a tourist. So for me, uh, I live in, in Ashwe Mandre now just because I wanted to live a quieter life. I wanted to live by the ocean. And I live a very simple life uh, in a basically a village. Um, which I, I find quite beautiful, and uh, there is some of the beach party stereotype involved with that, but I think uh, there's a sense of community uh, and simplicity over there, um, which I think is, is lacking a little bit uh, now, as people come to Goa and just see it as an empty canvas, as opposed to appreciating the culture and the history that is here beneath the surface, beyond just what you might see as you drive uh, on, on Para Coconut Tree Road taking your photos. <laughs> Well, and to that point, property is a very part of, a very large part of being in Goa, isn't it? Um, and the house that you live in or the house that you inherit is very central to your story here when you live and are part of this uh, wonderful place. So, uh, Michelle, what is the deal with, with property and Goans? Like, uh, why did you feel you needed to include a whole chapter on Portuguese property law? You know that for better or worse, you also own half of this property and half of this house because that's how property law works here. Sons and daughters both inherit equally and when you get married, your spouse also inherits half. So you also own this house with me. But it's really very complicated. There are too many steps and procedures, inventories, successions, partitions. You will read there are many, many terms and many, many levels. So I'm not going into any more details because I know that every good Goan here has their own property story that they would love to tell you. So while you are having Feni and Chori Spau, please talk to all the Goans and ask them about their own property stories that they will tell you. But after inheriting the house, that's not enough. You have to then manage and maintain this house. So, yeah, so this, this, and you have to watch which snakes are in which bedroom and um, who's sleeping with what kind of snake and make sure the dog, yeah, we've all been through that. Um, you inherited this house, uh, mom, from your father. Um, it was built in 1859 by your great, great grandfather. 
not just yours, but other people here who are also related. <laughs> Ingrid, uh, William, Jacqueline. You, you have to list now all your relatives who are here <laughs> <laughs> on that side. Um, but uh, then, so you inherited this property uh, after your dad passed away, unfortunately. And then talk to us about the, the joys and challenges of, of uh, restoring a house, adding to it. Amit's here as well. Um, what was that like? We were living in Bangkok at the time. Um, maybe Dad also has some insight here on what, what it was like. Yeah, I, I think uh, I won't go long, but I'll give you a brief uh, insight. We, we, um, we started work on the house in 2005, and uh, behind you, later on, the, what sits in the center of the, of the overall structure now was the original house. And we started uh, uh, you know, moving, well, repairing and restoring that, all with Amit's guidance, Amit Suktankara, architect, <laughs> who led us by the hand through the whole process. Uh, and we built two new wings, and this entire uh, structure was ready by 2009. And the idea was to respect and preserve the old house and to add two new wings to it, which would be modern, but fit seamlessly into the old house. So all that was complete by 2009. I'll end that little introduction by just saying that, you know, when we started the house, as Mich uh, Kunal mentioned, we were living in Thailand, in Bangkok. And we had an English friend, a uh, neighbor, and a good friend of ours who was building her house in Parosh in Greece, uh, her retirement home. And she laughingly said to us, you know what, you want to know how much your house is going to cost and how long it's going to take to build? Get three quotations, add them up, that will give you the cost, and that will also tell you how long it's going to take. So Amit, with you in the room, <laughs> I'm going to say, the experience of building a house in Parosh in Greece is no different from building a house in Goa uh, in Thule. So as a guidance, get three estimates, add them up. That's what you're going to pay. And add up the time, that's long how it's going to take. But Michelle, you know more, don't you? It's actually worse in Greece than it is in Goa. So <laughs> if you thought building it was expensive and exhausting, how do you feel about managing and maintaining it? Every day brings us new joys. Sometimes there are graceful birds and butterflies in my garden. On other, there are pests, the monkeys and the squirrels destroying the tiles on my roof, mango trees and walls collapsing. If you look closely at these coconut trees, you will see monitor lizards running up and Haruki chasing them. Sometimes you'll see woodpeckers pecking at them. Most recently in Sioli, people have been stung by wasps probably since we have encroached on their habitat, they have no place to go. So they're making nests and chairs in our houses. This construction is causing too many environmental emergencies. Sioli isn't the only village that has changed massively and been built up during the pandemic. So as Asagal, let's talk more about the most popular and controversial chapter where you discuss your theory on how Asagal became Gurgaon. <laughs> nice try, Diga. I'm not giving away any spoilers. You will have to read that chapter for all the gory details. Let's quickly move on <laughs> from a Goan headache to the Goan cure, Feni. A genuine appreciation of Feni finds a high place in your take on what it means to be Goan, doesn't it, Michelle? Of course. I know firsthand that you are now not just a bona fide fan of Feni, but an unabashed evangelist. How deeply did you dive into the subject for the book? It was really very hard. I had to suffer to this process. I had to suck it up and drink Feni to make sure I understood all the nuances of this fine drink. After all these years of serious drinking and tasting and prescribing and concocting, William here is the expert, as you will know, and he's curated many Feni uh, drinking for us. He and Cliff here helped me to read and fact check that chapter. But I have to say that Uncle Caesar's remains the best. Kunal, you want to tell your Moje and Diana Jones story with Uncle Caesar? So I only get up at five in the morning once a year to go with Uncle Caesar to Moje to, to buy the best Feni that you can get. Um, but in order for you to actually receive that, you have to have a pure heart, right? So the feni is not available just to anyone. You have, first you have to be accepted by Uncle Caesar, and then you have to pray that you know the, the the lady who makes it will give it to you because she 
she appreciates who you are and that your heart is in the right place. And then as Uncle Caesar says, it's a, it's a cure to many problems. So if you're feeling tired, you drink it. If you're feeling like you can't sleep, you drink it. If you have stomach problems, if you have marital problems, if you have psychological problems, you can drink penny and it'll, it'll take care of, it, of, anything, of everything. And we have some of that. Uh, the bar is gonna open a bit later, so, so feel free to try it. We worked very hard to get it. The other alcohol that's highlighted in your book and it's probably easier to get is gin. I know Goa has many amazing gins with more arriving on the scene regularly, and we know you're a gin enthusiast yourself. Ooh, how many people here have been subjected to all my gin tastings and gin <laughs> visits and going to gin bars? Tarno and uh, Ragini have had to come with me to a gin bar in Stockholm. It was supposed to be the best in the world. My whole family, who may or may not like gin, has been made to drink gin. Mitika and Arvind were dragged to gin bars in London with their two little kids. Who knew that people don't take kids to gin bars anymore? <laughs> but uh, it was all for a good cause. I think we can now add a gin evangelist to your credentials. <laughs> Do you think you've achieved your goal of becoming a gin influencer after writing your book? No gin company has called me yet to promote their gin, but I've been posting on Insta, and I'm hoping that I'll get my true calling to be a gin fluencer. I'm a bit confused. You're, you're trying to bust the golden stereotype of drinking by including two chapters, one on gin and one on Feni, in your book? Um, I don't know how that busts the stereotype. You know that Feni is therapeutic. It has medicinal benefits. We do it for our well-being. It's all an important part of being good. So I'm glad that stereotype is true. <laughs> and there's another stereotype in the book that you push back against, which is that Goans live a Suse God life. So what do you think about uh, you know this stereotype? And guys, do you think mom could ever be Suse God? I can, I can vouch for the fact that Michelle can never be Susegard. She lives to organize nag, you will remember Amit, <laughs> nag and rush around. As I like to call her, make work Michelle. Yeah. I really can't be Susegard and hearing this Susegard word to describe Goans is very annoying. We are all so hard working here. Yes. The other stereotype that really annoys me is the drunk Goan, because every time I tell people, say, where are you from? I said, I'm a, I live in Goa. They're like, <laughs> All right, okay, so no drunks and to say God Goans. Um, the other thing I've seen about Goans is how they can trace their ancestry back generations. They know all of their relatives, which Vado they originate from, and where they live now. So, Mom, are all Goans related, or are you just related to everyone? All Goans are related to each other, Kunal. Ask anyone here. Everyone is related to each other. It's not only Goans. All Indians are connected in some way, but it's just that we are very proud of our roots and we talk about which village you came from, which Vado you came from. It's all on my way to becoming a good Goan. So that brings us to the ultimate question. Mom, is this a how-to book? If people read this book, can they become Goan? No, 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 no. It's not how to become Goan. It's the story of how I am becoming Goan. So I've been told by many good Goans that, you know, you can't become Goan. You have to be born Goan. Everyone else remains an outsider. So after all this effort and all this reading about becoming Goan, we can't become Goan. No, no. That's okay. As long as you let us hang out. <laughs> um, so with that, we are wrapping up our family Q&A. And um, we want to open it up to your questions. So we have some time for about maybe five or six questions. Um, so if you have any questions to ask my mom, please raise your hand. And Divya or my, or my dad will find you with the mic. But um, mom? Before we take questions, I would quickly run through my many thank yous. Uh, first of all, thank you everybody for coming here today to listen to us and to celebrate my becoming Goan story and my Goa. A huge thank you to these three for putting up with me with my obsession about writing this book. 
My family, Ingrid, Brian, Mithika, Arvind, Samya, and Bing Bong, who are always here for me. All my cousins, uncle, aunts, who have known me my whole life, who are here from Goa and from Canada. Uncle Cliff, the last of the Dilimas. My Mendonca cousins, William and Jerilyn, the Dilimas from Canada, Anne and Vanessa. All my neighbors here, Uncle Nasi and Shaila, I have so many stories with them. They have special mentions in my book. Uh, I'm going to make a quick attempt to sort of run through my 57, oops, sorry, 58 years of my life. Uh, my St. Anne School Pune friend, Joni, who's here, Sister Prudence, who took over as the principal after my mummy retired from St. Anne. Um, family who I reconnected after moving here, Shalu, also known as Sarita Roy. <clears throat> My parents were her godparents. Vivian, mummy, was her godmother. She and Cliff uh, were both, uh, what were they? Flower girl and page boy at their wedding. You will find a photo in the book. Um, I can't thank everyone personally, but do look for mentions in my book. I've been getting some calls and messages. Michelle, I mentioned in her book, so am I famous now? <laughs> my reply is, I'm not famous, but I'm sure you will be. <laughs> getting back to my chronological thank yous, Freddie Birdie, the now famous Instagrammer, who I know from my first job in the ad agency, Rediffusion, who's here. After Rediff, I moved to Ogilvy. I'm lucky to have so many friends here from 35 years ago. Harish, Uday, Kalpana, Neville, and Lo. Malvika, who actually didn't work at Ogilvy, but was there a lot of the time. My besties from Dubai, Ragini, Tanu, and Radhika, who have flown in for the day to be with me here today. The Guhas, who we know from Dubai, London, and now Goa. So many people, all my neighbors here, Tanya, Maria, Irene, Alexi, Savio, John, my Guna, uh, Goa and Puna friends who are family to me and have been here for all my celebrations, Tammy and Keith, of course, Ravi Dada and Lakshmi, Joe and Purnima, the girls from the Stuti Academy Choir, Yay! and our great conductor, Parvesh. All the writers from the Goa Writers Group have come here to support me. Uh, those who are not here, I hope are smiling from heaven. All the people who've been guardian angels to me, my parents, my grandparents, aunts, uncles, especially my two Sioli guardian angels, my neighbor Anthony Coelho and Sister Marianne. I have to thank Rosie and Elvis who helped with the fantastic traditional Goan food we have and putting the bar together. We only have Feni and gin and some beer in keeping with the themes of the book. Uh, also to my bestie Picky for her special Portuguese going food. She's made her famous mushroom munde and apinha da camarao, also mentioned in my book. Many thanks to our ward member Amit Morajgad for setting up all the chairs, lights, table, sound. Most importantly, my neighbor Tanya here for generously offering her farm so that we could park here. I really hope I haven't missed out anyone today. Please do check the acknowledgments at the back of my book. And thank you again for coming. I have thanked them. They were the first people I to thank. Thank you. Thank you, Kunal, Bharat, and Divya. Thanks, Mom. Um, so questions, anyone? Does anyone have a question? Don't feel shy. There's one moving mic, so let me bring it to you. OK. okay go on, then. Thank you so much. That's great. Yeah, it should work now. Is it on? <laughs> yeah, it should work. No. No, no, take that. It will reach me now. Hold on. Hi. Um, it's kind of a cheeky question, mm. nothing too deep. Won't expect less from you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so if you had to rate the top three things you enjoy doing after becoming Goan, uh, what would they be? Let's say options are singing in the Stuti choir, <laughs> drinking... No prompted responses here. <laughs> drinking with your Goa writers gang in dingy bars, Writing at 3 a.m. or um, 
What else have you been up to? Oh, uh, drinking, 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 <laughs> basically, under the guise of research. <laughs> all good, all good. Uh, the one, Goa Writers, two, three. okay. Yes, one, two, three. Suti Choir. It's like uh, my, on my adventure to learn to sing. Parvesh is laughing, there's no hope for me. But <laughs> Um, of course, the Goa Writers Group, and so much uh, the MOCA, all the heritage walks that I've been going for, the GHAG heritage walks. Uh, so many people I've learned so much from, going to XCHR for all the talks and book launches and art, uh, so much of the art stuff that I've been to, a lot, a lot. That's away from this party, beach, uh, Goa. But you've conveniently left out the drinking bits. <laughs> There's no drinking. I'm sure it's in your top, <laughs> what, two <laughs> favorite things to do now in Goa? No, no. Anybody who wants stories about Michelle at Dingy Bars, come look for the Goa Writers Gang. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Bina. Any other questions? Don't feel shy. This is an intellectual safe space. <laughs> you can ask questions not related to the book. Okay, I guess if we don't have any questions, then Alexis? Yeah, we have oh, we do, we do. Thank you, thank you for your question. Yeah. yeah. Can you, can you? It's very dangerous to get a, a person like me to the mic, I kind of take over. <laughs> Yeah, but the uh, bar will open. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> is it politically correct to ask you what is GDD? <laughs> I know who set you up for this. No, no. Uh, you have to ask him. I'm not influenced easily. <laughs> <laughs> Lee over there has set Cliff up. We all met no, no. at yes. Dog Years Lee Bookshop. Who? Leave I have got uh, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of Delhi uh, hate in my book and many people were like, are you sure? And Lee gave me this term which he swore was a, a term he heard and it was in South Goa, not even in North Goa. It was called GDDs. He kept hearing people talking about GDDs and he didn't know what GDDs was. So he asked me, he said, Michelle, do you know? I'm like, no. He asked around, they said, those goddamn Delhi people. <laughs> Well, first of all, congratulations on the book. It's not only an achievement to finish the book, but get such a big crowd to attend the launch. I like the book even though I haven't read it because it talks about Hariku. <laughs> and I'm Haruki. A, Haruki. So tell us about your love affair with Haruki and has that led into dog welfare or other things from there? Glenn, the editors deleted my whole chapter on Haruki. There was a whole chapter, but apparently it didn't make this whole narrative arc. So you'll have to wait for my next book, which <laughs> will have a chapter on Haruki. Yay! Any other questions? Anyone? No? Yes. They've, they've nominated me to say something, so I will have to, I guess. Uh, this is not a question, but an observation, Michelle. There is a, and I'm not being nasty or rude here, but there is a bit of a dilemma in the book as I see it. The Goan diasporan has been the greatest shaper of this image of Goa, which we all accept today. Not necessarily in a bad sense, not necessarily in an in a authentic sense, but that vision is different from the vision that is here and uh, I myself came back 50 years back and I'm still struggling to, to uh, kind of overlap the two. I'm not sure that I'm accepted uh, like here myself because the good news to everyone coming in is that everyone is an outsider and I still get told you know your Konkani is bad man and this is something very common with Konkani speakers you know? they'll tell it to you in your face. So just two years back, I've got the courage to tell them, I know it's bad and I'm not going to improve. And if you have a problem, it's your problem. <laughs> so, so to bring this full uh, thing to a conclusion, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around 
of how the expat Goan feels so strongly for Goa. Besides what Goa is, partly created in his or her mind, which is not necessarily a bad thing, has done a lot to maintain it, but also has got it wrong in some places. I appreciate your effort to try to get it right, you know, get it cross-checked, talk to people. Not that, not that our views are any more authentic than anyone else's, but it's, there, is, there is some kind of dichotomy there, just that. I don't expect any response, and, and I don't have a response either on this. Thanks, Frederick. Yeah, just stay behind the speaker. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Hi, 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 Michelle. Uh, Ati, congrats once again. I have a question, quite elementary. Um, you're part of uh, Goa Writers Group, so I wanted to know what specific, uh, you know, contribution uh, they made, or you know, you learned from them from a group like that. And the second supplementary question is, how many? Uh, uh, Months did you write? Means from A to Z. How many months and roughly, uh, you know, how many hours a day did you spend writing? So, uh, to answer the first question, I think I joined a Goa Writers Group around the time that I had to submit the drafts to Penguin. So, they, I, I didn't have the benefit of the group when I was writing this book because by then it was always already going to Penguin and I was receiving feedback from them. Uh, however, the Goa Writers Group is bringing out an anthology now um, on um, ways of belonging which will be released in February at the Goa Arts and Literature Festival. And I contributed a short story to that. And for that, I received a lot of uh, useful feedback from the group and editing from Sheila and illustrations from Bina. And many people helped me with that story. Uh, I wrote, like, on some days, 10, 12 hours a day. Honestly, even walking my dog and doing my yoga, I felt was like tearing me away from writing. So it really consumed me this whole year. Uh, the only time I stopped writing was when I had given it back to Penguin and I was waiting for feedback. But even then I kept writing and Bharat would say, this has to stop sometime. You know, this has to stop. You can't just keep rewriting. So really, it, uh, this whole year, I mean, I worked, when I was writing, it was like 10 hours a day. And it was not like you wake up at 5, I was like waking up in the night, I was working in the afternoon, it was just a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Rahul. Rahul is also from Pune and now in Goa, but uh, he made the trip, uh, I think, many years before us. Okay, great. Any any other questions? There's a mosquito spray around at you guys, so so please please hand it to each other if anyone's struggling. Any questions? Okay, I think Alexi, if you're oh, there is one question. Tony has a question. Yeah. Just ask her. Just don't go in front of the speaker. Yes. Joni doesn't have a question. Joni just wants to congratulate Michelle Thank you. from our entire 81 class group. Thank you, Joni. Teachers, Thank really. You. Thank you. Well, well done. Thank you. Thanks. And all the best for the second one. <laughs> yeah. All the dog lovers are pushing me for that Haruki chapter. Auntie Vivian has a... Uh, I don't have a question, but I want to congratulate you. And I want to tell you that uh, I remember your mama. You owe all this English, fabulous English vocabulary from your mother. Thank you. So on behalf of the Dilema family, Clippy is here. I want to congratulate you, and I'm waiting for the next book. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Only because we've got into the realm of, thank, I mean, congratulating you and not questioning, because you know I would never question anything <laughs> you did, Michelle. So I just want to, I mean, we all love Michelle, this gorgeous girl who's now created this, you know, fabulous book that we all, I haven't read it yet, but I have read a bit. Uh, what I love about it is like it's a conversation with Michelle. 
and I love, you know, my church with Michelle. So, like, it's so nice to just step into your heart and into your mind and into your home through your book. And I think we all owe you a huge, you know, round of applause and thanks for that. Thank you, thank you. And Michelle and I have been very close friends for very long, much longer than, I mean, I'm much older, so you know, I, see her, I have seen her come of age and become Goan in many ways. A lot of my memories of Goa are tied up with Michelle. I think we used to come every year and spend yeah. Christmas and New Year with you for I don't know how many years. So True. my becoming Goan is through you in whatever to whatever, whatever little extent. And I just want to tell you that I'm so proud of you and congratulations. And you're just gorgeous and amazing. And you have an incredible family supporting you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the bar is open, I think. Oh, sorry, sorry, Alexi. Anyway, good evening. I'm so glad that uh, Michelle's been talking in the beginning. She said this is going to be my last book. But now towards the end, there have been two, three calls saying that I'm going to have my next book. And this is all about her next book. I won't say much. Michelle, I would like you to open it. And this is about from becoming going to You know, sometime back, I've been following Michelle's uh, stay in Seoli for a long time, and the last time we encountered together, we had this great coconut festival called Co Celebrating the Coconut. And you know, in Goa or, or in India, whatever, the coconut is symbolic of anything that you kind of uh, uh, you want to start something new, so you break the coconut. And this is exactly what has happened. I have baptized her by breaking the coconut on her head. <laughs> so from, and what I've written here is sequel to her best-selling book, Becoming Goan, Born Again Goan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Alexi has been a great support. He is this surely legend and everybody I spoke to Sam. Just talk to Alexi. He just talk to Alexi. He knows everything. And poor guy would turn up at his house at all times of day or night, and he was very helpful. He's done the caricatures for the Seoli chapter uh, because I couldn't ask anyone else. Uh, Rutuja, who is a good friend in Pune, has done most of the illustrations. And uh, my very young friend, Annalise, has done four of the illustrations. Thank you again, everyone, for coming here. Um, I, since I'm on this quest of promoting my book, I have to shout out a few more uh, events. Uh, Divya at Literati on Friday, we are doing Friday the 12th, in case you know anyone who wants to come for a Becoming Goan event. I'm also doing one at uh, Champaka in Vagator on the 3rd of February and Tea Trunk in Fontainish, I think, on the 9th of February. Uh, these are in Goa. I'm also going to Bombay, Pune, Bangalore, and Dubai, maybe. <laughs> Sorry for being so bold to walk up without being called. But I feel the need to be here on behalf of Bitty. In 1982, June, I took over in the primary section because I knew Bitty would be retiring in November, and they wanted me to take over then. So I feel her presence here very much on behalf of Biddy and your dear dad, Albert. Lots of love and blessings. Thank you to each one of you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, there's one, there's a question. Please come. Two questions.
Mike, Mike, Mike. Not too close to the speaker, Daniel. My English is not good, but I re I'm reading her book. Her book is very interesting how she is writing. She is writing very sweet and, you know, like fam familiar, like very close. You're reading very, you know, very, I, sorry, I find the intimate writing. Yes, this is, <laughs> you, are, you are there, you can say. But I love this book. Still, I'm not finished, I'm not fast reading. But I love how she writing, really, and how she is thinking. I'm very long time I live in Goa, and I love whatever she writes is somehow is very true. <laughs> Thank you. Sara is my yoga teacher. She's a refugee from Iran, and she teaches us yoga three times a week, um, and has been a great support. Okay. Hi. Michelle, as one of your cousins here, I just want to congratulate you and represent all our Mendonca de Lima cousins. And just, you know, we're so proud of you. you you've written, we've read pieces of your, your earlier pieces. They've always been gorgeous, and I can't wait to read this book. So congratulations, and we're so proud of you. Thank you guys for the questions, for being here, for welcoming all of us. And the bar is now open. There's some food as well. So let's have a good time and meet some new people and, and make some friends. And let's, let's have a good time. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.